Welcome to Bliss Oasis Africa, where we go out there bringing you untold stories of everyday people. Um, we have once in a while read articles, we read newspapers, and there are so many things you get in the newspapers. And uh, you may not have met the people behind the news. Luckily, you know this one, the one speaking. My name is Patrick Gogi, the owner of Bliss Oasis Africa. And I was a journalist once for a long time. And one of my colleagues, some of you may not have known him, but those of you who are legends, those who have, of you who have been there, you might have read a byline of Odhiambo Olale. Odhiambo Olale is a, an experienced journalist of many years. We worked together with him at the Daily Nation newspapers. Eventually, when time came to go do our own things, we went separate ways. And this going separate ways, we've been very busy doing our own stuff. And believe you me, since I left Nation almost a decade or two ago, I have never met Othiambo or Lala. We meet online. And today, I'm privileged to invite him to be a guest at our at our podcast, Bliss was Africa, so that he can tell us what he's been up to. Because many people, when they leave employment out there, they just fizzle out, they go out, nobody hears about them because they have retired and they are tired. But this is Uthiambolale, is a type of person who never says die. And we invite him today to talk to us about himself and what he's been up to since he left the show. Karibu Uthiambo. Asante sana. You'll excuse me if I use both English and Swahili. It's all right. Uh, we, are, we are told by Jomo Kenyatta, our founding president, that Kenya, yes. uh, Kenya, Kenya has national language, which is Swahili, <laughs> and uh, official language, which is English. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. This is my first podcast interview. So if I stammer, and blunder, uh, we will just accept and, uh, and allow me. <laughs> Others, thank you very much. What I can say is there's so much. We as uh, wordsmiths, as we call ourselves, uh, or journalists, yes. we have so many stories to, that we have written about yes. other people. But at times it reaches a point whereby, uh, especially when now the, your age makes you, the employer say, now you should take a walk meaning you should leave that formal employment. Yes. Many of us, unfortunately, we go with that institutional memory and uh, only once in a while, maybe in a pub for those who are still drinking <laughs> or uh, when, you, when you meet uh, casually at funerals, birthdays and such things is when we share the institution, the experiences that we went through. Uh, but I think that it, it, it is important that we, uh, journal veterans, we veterans, uh, who have seen it, who have seen quite a lot and had, it's good that we share those stories. Thank and you. that is why uh, since I left the nation uh, in uh, nine, uh, 12 years ago, at 49 years, my employer thought that uh, age was no, longer just a, a, uh, was no longer just a number. Yes. My employer told me that you, you, I, I need, uh, I've been on a list of what they call list of fame of those who are going to be given early retirement. Early retirement. Uh, so for the first 12 years, I have moved from Nation Media, where I had worked for 21 years, mm. to African Woman and Child Feature Service, which is a media NGO that focuses on gender, children, and uh, um, uh, transformative uh, leadership uh, issues. Mm. Uh, that is where I've been. <laughs> and uh, yes, okay, and uh, we, will, we will come to that and you'll give us a, a lot of information about uh, what you have done and some of that I think some of that I, I think started even before you left maybe you have an idea you are going to leave or you just is it a passion that you are doing outside while you are the nation but at least you had uh, what we may call a soft ground to land on but before we, we, we go deeper into your story, there may be this viewer who may not know Othiambo properly and uh, 
those who may know you just by name may want to know exactly what is behind you. And I'll just give you a brief of what you sent me as your bio data. Uh, also known as Daniel Tyras. <laughs> Daniel Tyras Odiambolale is a communication and, communication and media expert with vast experience both locally and internationally. He's a leading biographer and was one of the biographers of the Kenyatta cabinet and Moi cabinet published by Kenya Yearbook Foundation and also a key writer for Beyond the Shadows of My Dream by Martin Odor Otieno. Odiambo Rale has over 30 years of work experience in the media sector and has been a senior reporter, parliamentary reporter, bureau chief, investigation reporter at Nation Media Group. It continues, but we shall stop there so that we can go. And we just have the whole program talking about your resume. Anyhow, you, I think the last time we talked properly with you is when you were the you in Kisumu as bureau chief. That yes, was, that's right. That was late 90s, I guess. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us briefly, just chronologically, briefly what happened when you left Kisumu as bureau chief. Did you go back to the nation center or was it at the point when you were given, you were shown the door? As in uh, retirement. As as Kisumu bureau chief, I was there for seven years, and it was one of the most interesting and challenging aspect of my journalistic work. Okay. Because I was posted there in 1993, immediately after the first uh, uh, multi-party elections. Yes. That was uh, it was the first because most Kenyans did not know that there was another one that was there in 1969. Uh, yes. Anyway, so uh, it was very interesting and challenging because I was posted there when we had a provincial commissioner called Joseph Kagudi, yes. whose uh, brief seems to have been to bring down the Luos and fight the uh, opposition that was very strong at that time under Ford Kenya leader Jeremy Gogingo Dinga uh, and his uh, young tax, Railo Dinga or Joseph, Joseph Orengo, Boburu. Mm. Oginga, among others. Uh, so for the seven years, it was a lot of it. Uh, there was a lot of challenge in uh, balance, doing a balancing act between uh, Kanu leader, Kanu leaders speaking stories, and then the the opposition, yes. among others. But we survived. It was not easy. And then the coincidence was also at that time my dad also was got into politics as a Homer Bay County Council chairman. Mm -hmm. so, the, so that link between me and him uh, was, not, was not something that uh, Joseph Kagudi as a provincial commissioner, <laughs> meaning he was a spokesman of the president, uh -huh. and the, a representative of the president, was not happy about it. Mm -hmm. And even local politicians, powerful ones like Simon Nyachai in, uh, in Kisi and Dalma Sotieno in Lu, uh, in, uh, yeah, uh, in Luoland was not happy. But mm -hmm. all the same, for seven years, we managed to work. Uh, and uh, it was it was quite a, one of the most interesting and challenging times of my, my uh, professional career. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, uh, because of a, a train accident, derailment, uh, one evening, uh, the, when I was almost starting my, my eighth year, Mm. Uh, no, I was ending my seventh year. There's a train, there's a train driver who, with a mechanical or or human error, ended up with a, an accident. In and trains, when they have an accident, it's called a derailment. Mm. Uh, few, uh, it was on the Butere Kisumu line. Okay. So uh, it was somewhere near Kisumu town, about maybe uh, 10, 15 kilometers away. Uh, and uh, that that accident caused me my job as a bureau chief. Why? Uh, my boss called Wangedi Mwangi called me and asked me, Olali, what happened when he saw the headline, the standard, and not in the nation? Mm. Those are the days when you used to have what is called scoops. <laughs> so my <laughs> colleague at the standard, uh, 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 Wandalo, Harun Wandalo, yes, he had tipped me that there was a, there was a problem uh, he tipped me around 7.30. In the evening? Uh, and I said, uh, 
in the evening and uh but I, I, I'd, I'd been away out I, I was I was I was out of the office all day mm. <clears throat> so by the time I got that information the office at that time I thought it was too late to call the re relevant okay, the authorities office. and then also because of deadlines because yes. of deadlines yes I used my discretion not to follow up that story that I was going to follow the following morning okay but war unto me the following morning there was a big splash in the standard 10 people fear dead in a in a train derailment in Kisumu my boss told me no way we don't want it to put it in can you explain and the next thing even if I could explain told me come back to Nairobi immediately do you remember when that was which exactly yeah so I was asking myself as I was coming back to Nairobi feeling very traumatized was I an engineer or was I a journalist <laughs> <laughs> but to cut a long story short, I kept Nairobi and I was demoted from now being a bureau chief to being a parliamentary reporter, so, where I served for another three years before I got this. When was that? When was that? This accident. Time. This accident. When was that? This uh, the accident was I think in nineteen ninety nine. Ah, okay, okay. Yes. Just on the eve of the 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 what the hyped. Uh, Move, 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 move to the year 2000. Oh, you remember there's a big eye hype, especially in the IT. Mm. Now let me ask you: Were, yeah, they, were so, you, were you, when, when was the Robert Oko saga, the murder? Were you already in Kisumu? No, the murder happened when I was in. Uh, the murder happened when I was in Nairobi. Before you went, because it was on the eve of it. It was on the eve of 1992 election. The murder. The murder, yes. And you hadn't yet reported. You hadn't yet. I uh, uh, the murder of Robert Ouko. I I I I, intercept, I I interacted with it, with the with the stories when I was covering. Uh, I was a court reporter. In Nairobi. So I'm the one who covered. I'm the one who covered the one and only case murder case. That was filed against somebody in the in link in connection with Robert Ouko's murder. Robert Ouko's foreign minister and an MP for Kisumu Rural. Yeah. The man who was accused was called was a former DC for for Nakuru called uh, Jonah, Anguka. Jonah Anguka. Yes. I follow. I cover the story from beginning to the end in Nairobi when he was acquitted. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Now, um, you told me, you just mentioned the scoops. I remember because uh, like you, but I went later on, I went to Eldoret later on as a bureau chief. And I remember even when, even before I went to, to Eldoret, even in Nairobi, particularly if you are, you are in court, parliament, parliament, for example, or courts, and the, other, and the opposition gets a better story than you. In the morning, you are scared to come to the office because you will guess what what will be you'll be finding there. Lucky enough, yes. those, lucky enough, those days there are no more by phone, so they have to wait for you to get to the office. Very good. In fact, what you're saying is very true, and it's good as we are talk as journalists and people who have documented a lot of Kenya's history through uh, news coverage. One of the most embarrassing scoop. We love to uh, we used to scoops, but one of the most embarrassing scoop was by my colleague uh, Boniface Kaona in court when we were doing covering the Robert Ouko murder case, where Jonah Anguka was accused of being involved in the murder. Yes. Uh, one more one we one after one morning I I got I uh, go to the office, and there seeing the opposition paper, the standard newspaper, there was a big headline uh, quoting a story by uh, Boniface Kaona, who was a Tanzanian who came to Kenya and <laughs> fell in love with Kenya and even got a Kenyan wife. Yes. So here I was, I go to the office and Mutegi Njau was our news editor and you know how tough he was, yes. uh, abrasive and no nonsense guy. Yeah. So he told me, he, he quickly called me uh to get to go and meet joe kadi our managing editor Marayana. and also our group managing editor george mbugos mm. and then he they asked me to explain what happened so i told them i there was nothing i was going to say because i, I um, as a journalist i write about 
I don't write fiction. Oh, yes. I write non-fiction. So what I wrote in the, my story is what I had and what I saw. Mm. So they told me, okay, we'll give you the benefit of doubt. Go back to the courts. And then by lunchtime, we want you to, to confirm, no, to uh, clarify this matter. Mm. So there I was going to the courts. I felt like, you know, they say, there's that Swahili saying that uh, a cat, I feel like a cat that has been rained on. Mm. <laughs> so I went and, uh, and when I arrived in the courtroom, everybody was looking at me because I was representing National Media Group. And uh, Joe Boniface Kauna was also there representing the standard. And then now in between was uh, jo Bernard Chunga, mm. who was uh, uh, those days they were called uh, Deputy Public Prosecutor, yes. DPP. Yes. So uh, he looked at me. I saw him looking at me. And then I saw he had two newspapers, Nation mm. and Standard. And I said, my goodness, this time I'm definitely going to be I've been scooped, not only that, I'm going to be out of a job. Yes. But there I was, I said, because I'm uh, even at that time, just like now, it was very prayerful. I said, whatever will be, will be. let it be. In fact, that song by the Beatles was ringing in my head. Whatever will be, will be. <laughs> so when the, when the court, uh, uh, the judge came in and then there was a prosecutor, prosecutor was called Mohammed, and I think the judge was called Abdul Hussein, something like that. So uh, I, 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 my heart stopped, it almost missed a bit when Ben Achunga interrupted the, process, the, the proceedings. He said, your, uh, your Honor, sir, I would like to make a, 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 a submission. Mm. So I was there, I was a counter and I were looking at each other wondering now which is which. So there he was. Then the next thing Chunga said, uh, I, I, I'm I would like to refer to today's headline in one of the newspapers that is, even before he said it, my heart just stopped. I said, my goodness, I'm sucked. You're sucked. <laughs> that is misleading. Because you misled. When I had misleading, I wanted to jump and, sh and, sh and, sh and uh, vigile gele. Yeah, shout eh? joy. Celebrate. But of course, court of courts, you have to be, be well behaved. Yeah. So Chunga said that, uh, uh, told the judge that he was shocked to see such a headline, uh, quoting Yusuf Haji, who was a former uh, uh, pro provincial commissioner for, for Rift Valley, yes. where uh, Robert Ruko is alleged to have been kidnapped from Koru in Kisumo, in, Kis in Nyanza, mm. and taken to State House Nakuru, where he alle was alleged to have been murdered. So uh, Ben Achunga was there. Uh, I've never felt like having, a, I've never felt so happy that I have somebody who is, who is taking care of my interests, like Ben Achunga. Mm. He told, the, he ordered the, chap, the representative of the standard who wrote that story to stand up and, and explain how, the, how he has a story of, of fiction, mm. yet the nation have a true story. Wow. So, Bernard, uh, my colleague wanted to defend himself by saying that this is what happened, but he was not given a chance. Mm -hmm. He was just told to go and make sure that there's a there's a there's a, there's a correction that is prominently written and displayed on page one, like that one. Yes, and that was it. The matter ended there. And it was not just correction. So the judge also apology. said, "I he endorsed that uh, request." And uh, unless they get, a, unless there's a correction, they will be, they will not allow any standard reporter to go to that court and misquote people. <laughs> so there was the proceeding and continued. And my friend, I'm the, uh, my friend, I could see my friend, my friend and colleague now who had scooped me. Now he's going to look like that cat that had been rained on <laughs> because he was taking notes. But his heart was not in that case, in that was shaking. But here I was, yeah, but here I was very happy, knowing in my, the, the, the back of my heart, yes. that yeah, I, I'd, I'd lost 10 minutes. And in court, even one, even one, five minutes is, ba is bad enough. Mm. I'd gone for lunch the previous day and I'd overstayed for 10 minutes. Mm. So when I came, the, pro the proceeding was going on. Mm. 
So that matter was, was raised when I was not there. Which matter? But you see, um, the matter of uh, Anguka, and uh, what do you call it? Uh, use of Haji, Haji testifying. Mm. Mm. Yes, he started testifying when I was, uh, when I was there, not there. I came five, 10 minutes after him. So I missed the part. So what do you miss? Because he did say it. He actually said I it. I missed it because I was late. He actually said it. But I, because I was late and I was scooped, it was <laughs> not in my interest to cover up by saying I never had it, so I cannot con I cannot vouch for it. But it's true, you never had it. And when I went back to and when I went back to my home to, to our nation house office, editorial room. Uh, one Mr. Mutegin Jao could not believe the way I was uh, I was like a peacock, you know, a peacock for uh, <laughs> trucks. That was one of the happiest days in my journalistic so you are no life. So you are no longer reigned on cut. You are now they are very happy with me. They said, yes, Olali. okay, this is very right. You, you, we know you. I mean, how could somebody? <laughs> I, I didn't tell them until a week later that I can, you know, you guys, I was really, really scooped. Yeah. But because of the embarrassment and the politics that went with it, mm. that is how it happened. So that is that was one so, of those. So, so, so let uh, me ask you. So let me ask you. Haji actually said what he was quoted. I was not there when no, he, you when he was there. testifying. Yeah, I you was not ten there. minutes late. But yes, you, but you... Kaona, Kaona, who was there, wrote what he had. And do you know whether that's what he actually said? Would you know? Or because it was only published in the standard, then the prosecutor. It was a matter of life and death for me, so I, I was. It was in my interest not to believe that that Yusuf Haji said it. But the truth of the matter is, he said it because it's not only he said it, but these were some of the issues that were also raised in the contra. Con, co, what do you call it? In the conspiracy theory. Right. And, and what was the argument? The argument was that the Nation newspaper mm. did not have that story. <laughs> they do not care about Kenya Times. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Scoops are good, but some of them, yeah, they like the one good. of my the train accident derailment yeah. that caused me my job in in uh, as a bureau chief in Kisumu. Mm. There's also a, a brighter side that at times you, the scoops can be in your favor rather than against you. It's true, and I remember those days. Yes. Uh, those days in uh, courts. And we used to have Kaona, we used to have uh, Andrew Puria in Nation, you and other people. Yes. Sometimes we would share scoops. Sometimes yes. we would share what, we, what would have been a scoop. Because yeah, we, when the story was too hot, yeah. we would agree that this story is too hot, let us share. Yes, because... And in fact, after that experience with the, with the Kaona, mm. uh, we sat down as court reporters and we said, listen, as much as when we scoop, we are happy, Mm. Our ego is boosted, and in the evening, those are days we used to enjoy our cold one mm. and sun cheek and other pubs. <laughs> yeah, we put the newspaper on, on, we put that we display the newspaper page one story mm. for everybody else who didn't, who maybe, maybe are not seen that newspaper. Oh, yes, eh? as, a, as a as a as a as a what do you call it, a de de decoration. Yes, to yes. also <laughs> confirm that we are tough, we are tough more hinds, we are tough <laughs> the reporters. <laughs> Yes. So that was uh, that was now the other side of, of the scoops. Tough boy, indeed. <laughs> yes. So um, you went back to Nash, You went back to from from Kisumu. You went back to courts, parliament. You went to parliament. Uh, no, I went to parliament. I covered parliament for almost five years. Five years. What would you say was the most yes. memorable period as a uh, parliamentary reporter? As a parliamentary reporter, uh, there are a number of highlights, yeah. but I think the most, the, the, the one that comes to mind immediately, mm. uh, uh, I think those uh, on, 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 uh, on one of the, uh, on the eve of the end of the 1990, 1997, Parliament. I don't know which parliament it was. I cannot say exactly. Mm. Uh, I managed to had had some good PR with the parliamentary, seen as parliamentary uh, uh, reporter. I mean, staff. Mm. 
Mm. One of them who was in charge of the IT, he co-opted me to join a committee mm. uh, of uh, what the, the government had introduced, what they were calling uh, uh, RRI, mm. Rapid Results Initiative. Okay. Whereby within six months, each department was supposed to identify what they wanted to achieve and, that, and then make sure that within six months, fix, fix, they call it quick fix. Mm. Within the, first, the next six months, they will do it. So th this particular team, well, we may, held some meetings in parliament and uh, <clears throat> then we or they organized a trip to, a one week trip to Rwanda, mm. Kigali, Rwanda, where we went to, to uh, benchmark. Mm. Even us, we used to eat allowances for benchmarking. Uh, uh, these MCAs have learned from us. <laughs> so I uh, was the only non-parliamentary non staff yeah. with them. So we went to the Senate, we went oh, to the no, you went to the blessing of the mission. Yes. Mm. But it was it was under the Parliamentary Service Commission. Okay. All expenses paid. So wow. we went and we 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 we, 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 we attended the parliamentary session mm. and the Senate. And the idea was to start and study and see how they have embraced IT in 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 in, in, in the legislature. Yes. In terms of electronic voting, mm. in terms of, uh, of uh, what do you call it, uh, members of parliament yes. uh, reducing the number of the par par parliament and senate reducing the cost of, uh, of uh, running the place by making it as paperless as possible. Mm. So the daily order paper, unlike in parliament of Kenya, they have to have the paper. But mm. there, everything was digital. Mm -hmm. And what impressed us were two things there. Number one, even their cabinet meetings, their president, uh, uh, Paul Kagame, would, would not entertain anybody coming with the briefcase like we see in Kenya. You come with your laptop wow. or with your tab, with your, nice. what do you call it? IPad? It's called iPad. iPad tablet. You come, yes, you come with that and that's what you're going to contribute from. Mm. That is one. Then the other thing also impressed us was that the person who was helping Kagame to to uh, fast track IT uh, embrace, to embrace IT in the cabinet and in the government structure and even in Parliament and Senate was a Kenyan, former MP for Rangu, is a friend of mine, in the, Dr. In Shem the, Ochuodo. Yeah, yeah, he was a presidential advisor on IT. Mm. So I even met him and my, it was it nice to have even a, uh, not only just a friend, a, a colleague, but also uh, we call them, we call ourselves ja, Jana, ja, Janam, meaning people from the lake. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, so for a whole week we were there, uh, we went through, we, we, we met the speaker and the, and the clerk to the Senate and also to the uh, parliament and they took us around and uh, it was one of the best uh, uh, what do you call official engagement in an African country mm. as a as a uh, what do you call a VIP mm. uh, reminds me when when we talk about VIP in Kenya is is a very important person yes but uh, there's a my famous my favorite Nigerian uh, musician Fela Ransamkuti Yes, he had a song called VIP, and you know, Fela Ransamkutu was there at the time of military dictatorship, whereby every now and every year also you'll find one dictator uh, being overthrown in a coolness. It's what mm -hmm. they're claiming coolness, bloodless coup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's like they were sitting on a table, and then after two years they tell somebody, "Umesha kule kutosha." You've eaten enough. <laughs> now can you move out? So they have a they have a bloodless coup and somebody else takes over. Uh, anyway, back to Feller and Samkuti. His song VIP, to, which he was using to fight the government as an individual, as a musician. Mm. He, he called it VIP, which to him man, meant vagabonds in power. Wow. VIP. <laughs> so every time he played it and the, the military people heard it. Uh, would break into his uh, his his big uh, his big compound where he was calling it Kalakuta Show, uh -huh. and he would clobber them and break his instruments. But it will still come up again because they would not be able to detain him. Because how do you detain him? And he's so popular, and you know yes. he, he was polygamous. 
Yes. He had over 50 wives, so at least so he told her. <laughs> Vagabonds in power. So if he, anyway, he, in Rwanda... If he, if, he, if he decided to hide Kwa huyo bibi moja, utajua mena wapi? Utajua. Unless you arrest So in wives. Rwanda, we were given VIP treatment uh, throughout, and we, but we did not have, we were not able to see the, the president who some people claim Mm. Uh, 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 claim, uh, some people uh, have branded as a, a bene benevolent dictator. Ah, ah. Benevolent or not, Rwanda is one of the, Kigali is one of the cleanest cities I've ever seen in Africa. So I and hear. very organized. I hear mm. it is like Paris in, in Europe, but yeah. I've never been there. So what but you want, to learn, what, what you want so to learn and batch bank, batch mark in uh, Rwanda? Kigali, when you came back, was it uh, implemented in the six months? Did yes. In fact, when we came back, mm. uh, the Speaker of the National Assembly, that time we didn't have a Senate, Mr. Francis Le Caparo, mm. implemented the, all our recommendations. One is electronic voting. Mm. Number two is paperless, uh, paperless parliament proceedings. Mm. every day and then the other one was uh i the whole place they spent all millions of shillings to upgrade to wire the place and make it computer uh it compliant okay and now that the, the mps were also able to use their laptops all right in the chamber which oh. our region before that time it was like it was banned okay okay yeah thank you um we've uh, done part one of this interview and uh you told us a lot about your time at Nation, and we are going to take a short break. And when we come back, uh, we will hear more particularly about what happened after that. You left Nation. What have you been doing? And then looking back and looking forward. So uh, viewers, we take a short break and we'll come back right now. Thank you. Beautiful. How many minutes? Uh, my name is Odia Odane. I'm a journalist, I'm a blogger, and I'm a biographer. This is one of the books that I've written, uh, joined with my wife, Rosemary Olane, and also our friend, uh, Barak Moluka. It's a, it was a biography of Martin Odur Otieno, former long-serving uh, CEO, Chief, Chief, uh, Chief Executive Officer, Kenya Commercial Bank. And I want to introduce my daughter to you, Terry, Terry Gertrude Achien. She, is, she has also decided to join us in our profession of being writers and uh, artists. She will tell you about her upcoming project. Karibu, Terry. Thank you. My name is Terry Gertrude Chingonale. I am a 27 year old, currently living and working in Nairobi, Kenya. I have an undergrad from the University of British Columbia where I specialized in sustainable development and I have an interdisciplinary degree studies from there in liberal arts. I'll go on to talk about my hobbies. I love art, music and literature and as you can see here, this is one of the art pieces I have done. And at the end of this year, I plan to have an art exhibit where I'll be showcasing a project that I'm currently working on. I'll go over now to talk a bit about my book. My book is called Victors and it follows a character called Frank. He goes to a school called Victors and a competition is announced there by his dean called Dean Aquila. The book continues and follows Frank trying to, to, um, trying to um, win the competition. The book is inspirational and I'm very passionate about it. I started writing it about three years ago and it should be in publishing then by the end of this year and it should be available in bookstores. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I uh, will show you some of the archives, some of the tools of trade that we use, like the typewriter. We have now upgraded to the phone, but this is one of the ones that I used to use for 21 years at the National Media Group. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to you buying our books when they are released, my memoir and my daughter's book. Thank you very much. Bye.
Welcome again, viewers, to Bliss Oasis podcast. And today we are discussing old stories and new stories and the future, the past with one, Udiambo Olale, a journalist and a colleague for many years. And in the first part, he told us his experiences in journalism in nation, parliament reporting, courts, and as bureau chief in Kisumu. So in this section, we are going to talk about what he's done since he left nation. And he's written a number of books, so he's taken part in writing and publishing some, some biographies. And he's also instrumental in starting a, a features, a news features, um, uh, a new features agency, which is going to tell us about. And welcome back again, Othiambo. So tell us after you got those, or rather, eventually you get you got out of nation. Tell tell us about the books you wrote or the books you helped publishing. Thank you very much. It's gl I'm glad to be back again. Um, uh, when I left the nation, it's good that we also understand in what context. Uh, we are, I was called one morning, we were, told, we were given 30 days to, to prepare for the, the D-Day. So on that D-Day, I was called for a meeting with our editorial uh, managing editor, Joseph Odindo, uh, Swale, who was uh, head of um, uh, human resource, and David Aduda, um, editorial manager, editorial director, no, manager. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they told me, Olale, you're on this list. So I shocked them by telling them, thank you very much for, conf for making it now public that now I'm on the list. What and list please hold your horses. What was, what please list? hold your horses. What list was this? Please hold your horses. Before you say anything else, I have three things to say. And they were shocked because usually such sessions are usually very acrimonious. Yes. And traumatizing. Mm. So they were shocked. They expected me to be in a fighting mood and all that. I told them, I told them, number one, I want to say thank you. 21 years, a long time to work, to work in any organization, special nation with all these uh, intrigues and everything else. <laughs> number two, number two, I would like you to extend this new spirit of uh, this policy, this uh, policy of putting a human face to this, what is be, well, that time was called retrenchment exercise. Oh yes, we are grown up. We are responsible people. It's not. It's not right for management to wait for somebody to come to the office dressed like I'm dressed with my tie here. <laughs> yeah? The ladies have their sweet, their beautiful marenda. We call, yes. uh, during colonial, they call marenda skirts. Yes, and then at lunch time, you can, you are told, can you see the HR? And when you go to see the HR, they tell you. This is your letter, go home. We don't need you anymore. Mm. I told them, no, it had happened before and that was very bad. So I, tell the, I told them, I want to also thank the management for doing that. Mm. And then the third one, they were really shocked. Yeah? I asked them, uh, I, I asked them, you know, as a journalist, we ask questions. Yes. Doesn't matter even if it's your boss, you'll ask questions. Because <laughs> that's what you're paid to do. ask questions. So what did I ask? I told them, I asked the HR uh, uh, manager. Can you please confirm what you've been telling us in all those many training, training uh, uh, programs that we've been having, total quality management, this and that. Uh, and what I want you to confirm is that uh, as an employee who is now being given this early retirement, do I have a right to do what? To write an exit report? Because I have a lot of institutional memory, I don't want to go with it. <clears throat> and the guy was shocked, he said, what? I mean, nobody has ever asked me for that, about that. I say, yes, I'm asking you because I have this in your memory and I'm not going because you have sucked me and I'm not going because I've died. <laughs> because that's how, that's how I've resigned. That's how, mm -hmm. many, that's how people leave organizations. Mm -hmm. The moment you're employed, the next thing is like when you're born, you know, you, another time you're going to have a birthday, another time you'll be sick, another time you may die. Yeah. So after they assured me of that, I was very happy. And then they continued. So and I think that is exactly one of those. What were you exactly going to write? And did you write it? I did write it. I wrote about story about the other the intrigues that was happening behind the scenes. Why I thought I was being frustrated here and there, and what I think they could do even better, like this ah. particular one of exit policy. Okay. So, so we you finished with that, and then so and so then Olale, I was, so Olale, you say that 
you were on that list. How many were yes. you? How many were you in that list? Did you know who we were, were there? I think almost, we were almost 20 people from the newsroom. Yeah. And uh, then there were others from other departments. Oh, all right. And then there another, another lesson learned from that experience that I had at that particular meeting with them, yeah. which was not, which was not an acrimonious, mm. was that uh, um, uh, two weeks later when my check was being processed, it was almost ready, one of our, uh, some, one of our colleagues who was in the finance department, salary department, mm. called me and told me, your check is almost ready, but I've stopped it. I was asked why. He said, I've stopped it because you are going to be under, under what do you call it? You are going to you are going to be given a road deal. You oh. are in the union, and maybe that's why you are not put, promoted. Uh, I've intercepted it, and I, I'm insisting that because you are in the union and the KUJ, Kenya Union of Journalists, had signed a management team, had signed a had signed a MOU with the, with the National Media Group, mm -hmm. KUJ and uh, National Media Group. Yes. Or oh, as a pri private company, uh, so therefore the retirement age for private companies sixty years. They are the ones who came to you and told you they want to gi uh, give you early retirement at forty nine years. So eleven years, I've insisted, told them you are those ones you're entitled to, and that's exactly what happened. I managed to get uh, like extra money from uh, the. From, from that uh, kind of that uh, because of that MOU. Because uh, some yes, of my but... colleagues also, also demanded to get it, but somehow they, they went about it, even threatened to go to court. <laughs> they did not get it. Uh, lesson learned from that is let us not burn our bridges wherever we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not That's just cool. in the department, in other departments, have a good PR. Mm. And have positive so energy. Posi positive. So despite, despite your tough talk with them, you are still in good books and they allowed you to yes yeah because you are telling them like it is in a in a in a in a genuine manner not like acrimoniously yes that's right and then the other thing also at that particular time for those who are listening and are in employment or are uh, out of employment but are maybe you are looking forward to going to employment Another lesson, a big lesson learned is that it is also very important that when you're working somewhere, you don't just put, you don't, you, you should not, you should stop, uh, you should not have that attitude of uh, um, ostrich mentality. You know what ostrich mentality is? Putting your head in the sand. Come on, Pewa Kazi at the National Media Group, for example, or in whichever other organization, you just stick your head in that organization and you don't do anything else other than just work going there morning evening maybe the closest the, the 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 only time you get off route is when you pass by sanchik or another pub or restaurant or maybe your church no <laughs> you must have hobbies and uh, and interests that you can also promote as you do your work is a hobby then later on when you when you leave formal employment you can pick it up and go with it as that's your passion. You must have a passion other than your job. Yeah, it's true. And I think that's why you, <clears throat> that's how you had a kind of a soft net. When you left nation, you went to something you had been doing earlier and continued. Maybe you can mention, tell us about that. Yes. Yeah, that is another very interesting one because that's, that's what some people call uh, soft landing. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was leaving the nation, uh, my wife, uh, Rosemary Okelo Lale, had started an NGO called, uh, she also went into media, uh, called African Woman and Child Features Service, together with other journalists, Rose Lucalo, who, was, uh, who later on was an editor of the uh, Kenya Television, the first uh, news editor of Kenya Television Network. Mm -hmm. She was sacked, can you imagine, because uh, she, she allowed uh, her news to be broken uh, on Christmas Eve that spoiled President Daniel Arap Moe's Christmas. And what was the news? <laughs> Former Vice President Emilio Mwai Kibaki has resigned as Minister for Health. That was... And he has joined, he has formed a opposition party called D uh, DP, yes. Democratic Party of Kenya. Yes. But uh, of course, when he was campaigning later on, I hear some people in Kiambu were very derogatory. 
they were, de they were describing DP as dead party. <laughs> One of our colleagues, when he, when he went to cover the, when he went to cover Matiba, no, um, uh, Kibaki is rallying uh, Kiambu at one time on the eve of the 1992 election. His intro was very interesting. He was from Moranga, so somehow, of course, I think we suspected his his heart was with Matiba, not uh, not uh, <laughs> not um, Baki. Yes. So his intro was that at the Kiambu presidential uh, Kibaki's presidential campaign rally. He, the, the, as he chanted DP, the crowd she was, was shout, shouting back, dead party, <laughs> DP, <laughs> dead party. <laughs> and that was the intro. And my goodness, didn't we love that story? Now tell me, let's go back to, <clears throat> you're telling me about AWC and this girl, this lady who was uh, stuck at KTN. That's very interesting. How do you get- Rose Lucalo. How, how Rose who? Rose Lucalo Owino. Yes. yes, she was such. She was one of the founder members of AWC with my wife, together with Juliana Omale Atemi. All right, and she was sucked because. So when I left, when I left the no nation, I had a soft landing in that NGO. Yeah, what I'm asking. Yeah, that's okay. My wife being an NGO, being a founder. But also we were, we, we, I was, we were what some people also call, I don't know how true it is, but uh, you know, English is a sweet language. <laughs> Sleeping Sorry? So this was, uh, uh, so like I was asleep, they call it a what? Um, I was a sleeping board, they call it what? A board member. Oh, okay. Sleep. Ah, uh, yeah, sleeping partner. No, that expression. <laughs> yes, well, yes. I, I was supporting her, but my, my, I was other nation. You, you and I was supporting that why, because you, you of that shadows. conflict of interest. Yeah, so uh, it, because of that kind of conflict of interest, so even now she's, she she decided that she was not going to use a media name because it was a mid, it was a news feature NGO. Yes, I so get it. So when they were bringing stories to the nation, they want she was more comfortable for them to look at the product as it is rather than now whose wife is this or whose husband is this and who works where. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, my soft landing was at the AWC where I've been for the past 12 years. Mm. And the first three months of my being out of the nation, thanks to her connection, I also managed to get a, I managed to get a, a consultancy with a full FAO. FAO means what? Food agriculture? World Food of Food yes. organization. Food agriculture organization to go and be a consultant in uh, in in the coast province. They had a farmers food field farmers uh, farmers uh, field school project mm. that uh, I was going to monitor do monitoring and evaluation of it. Yes. Uh, in Kuale, in um, Taitataveta, and in uh, and in uh, where, in Kilifi. Mm. So it, it was a very, very good uh, and, and, uh, good opportunity to, to see what happens outside the world of okay. media. All right. Yeah. But since then, fast forward to there, to now, uh, we have done a lot of work, both in Kenya and outside. One of the most uh, challenging and also uh, ch uh, interesting one was when uh, AWC managed to sign a, a contract with UN Women. Mm. in Sudan, Southern Sudan, on the eve of their independence and their referendum and all this. Mm. So we, we were part of a team of uh, Kenyan journalists okay. uh, who are going to, who spent almost two years in and going in and out of, of um, South Sudan to, mm. to do what? Uh, to help them with capacity building, okay. the media, we managed to help them to start a uh, uh association of of media women in south sudan yes which was like a counter which was like, like uh we picked the, uh, which was like the one which was started in kenya called amwik mm. association of media women in kenya ah. and at the same time we also went further because our strength is gender and media mm. we also did a lot of capacity building to help the journalists in south sudan in particular juba to start an association like Kenya Editors Guild, which was also started, which was also um, the brainchild of AWC and other mm. other partners. 
Okay. So uh, while we were there, they, we also managed to get the Sudan Sudanese journalists to start a Sudanese editors uh, guild. All right. Um, yes. So how did the the idea of uh, establishing the editors guild come about? The idea behind starting the editors guild was uh, because at that time there was a big break between the time when the uh, in Kenya, there was there was there used to be one a similar a similar organization, headed by former managing editor of uh, uh, KTN Hamani Gambi. Mm. Uh, but it collapsed because the, of course there's a lot of politics internally among other things. Mm. So it was uh, the the media some of the uh, senior media official uh, members thought that it was time that we had our own media. Uh, organization that would take care would uh, be like a uh, professional body mm. to to cater for the interest of of uh, editors yes. and uh, the media as a whole. Okay, and it was through that initiative, other than having AMWIC established and uh, KEG Kenya Editors Guild established, we all, they also went as far as even lobbying the government to have the. To have uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, to um, uh, what's the word um, to create a jo an office mm. of the government spokesman ah. because at that time well, that was also an issue mm. that now who is that we talking is it Joseph Kamodo Kamisa <laughs> General or is it Nicholas Dewar powerful minister in the cabinet. Uh, or is it done a lot of points? And those who don't that, know, and those, those, who, are, who, that, those, who, are, that, that, those who are listening and who don't know who Joseph Kamolo was, maybe you can tell mm -hmm. them who was Joseph Kamolo. Yeah, Joseph Kamolo was a powerful cabinet minister, he was a minister for education, he was a minister for general. And whatever he said was as good as law. Mm -hmm. He was that powerful. At so that time, those, those sort of, uh, let me use the word cacophony. The people are talking so much, everybody is talking, but the policy, we, we, uh, the media was confused. Now, who is the one who is talking about government policy? Mm. Omoi was all, as usual, whenever he was traveling and he loved to travel all over the country, he, he loved these roadside declarations. Yes. But in terms of policy and, and, and the implementation, well, those need to have that. And that's why now when the NAC government took over from Kanu government, mm. the office of the government spokesman was created and Alfred Mutua, doctor, mm. uh, who used to be a nation uh, correspondent who was writing stories about traveling, mm. thanks to his good connection with Kenya Airways. So he would travel all over the world where Kenya Airways had some links and he'd write mm. an, a, a column every week called Msafiri. Yes. So yeah, so back to now AWC. So other than helping to do this, this uh, what do you call it? Uh, helping to start to promote this uh, media, um, um, yeah, media stakeholders, mm. uh, professional bodies. We have also been very strong in uh, in uh, in promoting uh, gender agenda. Mm. So one of the things that we, we do, I do, is to write, we have two pu publications. One is Kenyan Woman, mm -hmm. where we highlight, we give women uh, uh, a voice and uh, uh, a voice and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, visibility. Mm -hmm. They liberate me. So that magazine, that's what it is. Even right now, on the run, in the run up to the uh, August 9th election, we have a special magazine also called Siasa Sasa. Mm -hmm. Where we are featuring, we are exclusively featuring featuring women uh, MCS, women parliamentary candidates, women uh, senators mm -hmm. uh, candidates, and uh, governor candidates. And of course, now we have only one, and some and a few uh, women running mates. Okay, and uh, where can one get those magazines? Where are they? Are they in the streets? Are they online? There are two magazines I told you about, one called Kenyan Woman, the other one is called Reject. Reject was also started about five years ago. This one is about, we highlight stories on non-political stories, and we also don't do hard news. Mm. We do human interest stories, mm. 
yes. that have a, trans have a transformative nature. Mm -hmm. In other words, we uh, the, the idea behind it was the idea was picked in uh, South, in um, in uh, South, in in India where they had a similar publication, mm -hmm. uh, and the idea behind it is to give the the correspondents, the newspaper writers, uh, reporters. Yeah, who are not on the payroll, an opportunity to sell and use their stories in another place rather than having it, sending it to the newsrooms of the mainstream. And then the story dies there because of space, because of uh, other politics and all that. So mm -hmm. for the past five, seven years, we have been, we have been uh, having those stories. Mm. Oh, the, all, the two of them, oh, they used to be hard, we used to uh, have bad copies, but of late, we have now moved to online. They are all online okay. publications. Uh, they're news features. <clears throat> all right. So with funding from, uh, with mostly funding from our donors. Mm. So that's why they are for free. All right. So, um. You also, when when I was reading uh, your background, you also have authored some books about Kenyan cabinet, Moi cabinet, and Moi whatever Moi cabinet and something else. Yeah, that's right. Uh, one of the things that I've actually realized uh, almost uh, twelve years later, uh, since I left mainstream media, is that we have so much institutional memory in our heads. In our school, in our in our school, uh, I went to Jericho. I went to current primary C, Kenya current current C primary school, mm. where Jimmy Wanjigi. For those who now the, the millennials know Jimmy Wanjigi. Mm. Jimmy Wanjigi was my schoolmate, not classmate. He's younger. <laughs> he was about three four classes behind me. <laughs> yes, he was your schoolmate. Then I went to Jericho. Then I went to Jericho secondary school. Yes. Because um, I was my uh, my 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 preference was Lenana, which was like our sister school mm. in the current area. But my marks embarrassed me. Uh, uh, the other one would have been up Upper Hill, mm. but my marks were still not good enough, so I ended up in Jericho. All the same, from there I went to the uh, University of Arizona. Thanks to my dad, I had some money, mm. so I went for my undergrad there. Mm. I would have loved to do masters by kidney personalization, and I would, I somehow didn't feel like I wanted to stay in the US any longer. Mm. So, so that is what happened. Mm. Now, in terms of books that I've written or have been part of the team, mm. yeah, these mm. ones have happened because of the institutional memory that I have, mm. and then the opportunities that we do have out there. And it's very important that we do networking. Mm. It's good. Don't burn your bridges, like I said earlier on. Yes. Always make sure that you have people who you've worked with, or you, or you even make try and make a friend every other day, if possible. Yes. Yes. So one of the books that we biographies that we have uh, been part of the team was the one by of uh, Martin Oduro Tiena, who was a long-serving uh, chief executive officer of Kenya Commercial Bank. Yes, it was a very he, popular he approached, he approached my wife and uh, Barak Moluka mm. to help him write a book. And there we were. Mm. We wrote that book called Beyond the Dreams. Okay. Yeah, so we wrote that book together. Mm. And it was so nice. You know, there's nothing as good. I think it's like we, uh, our, our wives, or, or even uh, even that even men love it on the day when you are told that now you it's a baby boy <laughs> or it's a baby guy. Yeah, the day of uh, when the book was launched you at are Serena, right. it was so wonderful sorry jo that sense of of satisfaction yeah, yeah accomplishments yes. so uh, yeah so we had uh, richard leakey former in the in the head not former former head of the government who was a who was lead who was a team where Martin Oduro, you know, mm. so he was there at the launch among other members of the um, other members of the dream team like um, um, Kitilimbadi. Mm. Uh, uh, 
na writers like Kuni uh, uh, and among others. So that was a, that was a very, very big climax to uh, showing that being in the, be, being, be, being uh, outside the mainstream, or some people call it being out of, out of formal employment mm. is, is not the end of the world. We must open yeah. up. It is and that connection helped us because now Muluka will double as a writer and is also a publisher. Yes. My wife will help you a good connection as an editor. Mm. And then she had also some good connection with Ford Foundation, mm. which also helped with the funding. Oh, and then me, I came in as a writer, reporter, and researcher. Okay. That was one. Then the other one, uh, the other book that uh, the, I've also been involved in is the, I've uh, been part of the team work, uh, working with the Kenya Yearbook Foundation, mm. Mm. Where, whose current uh, CEO is. Uh, is Ed, Edward uh, Mwasi, mm. former nation chief graphical um, um, uh, manager. Mm. Uh, so with them, I managed to, to help them write two, two books. Mm. Uh, one is the Kenyatta cabinet, Jomo Kenyatta, mm. uh, who ruled the country for 15 years for youngsters, we don't know. Mm, sure. uh, so I was given specific names mm. of former cabinet ministers to interview. Mm. and write a, a biography about them and mm. how they uh, and the experience in the Kenyatta government and this wow was, that was so nice who was who are still alive you can imagine the challenge the, the, the how sweet it was to interview those who are still alive like William Odongo Mamo mm. former MP for for um, for Bondo Kaliech uh, Kaliech that was his other name elephant because you had mm. a huge body huge car Huge house. I hear even his house. His wife was also huge. Yeah. And for those who, who don't know, his daughter is now is in the Uru cabinet yes, as a it. minister. She, she's now she's a current minister for foreign affairs. Oh, foreign affairs. Rachel yes. Omamo. Yes. So we did the Kenyatta Jomo Kenyatta cabinet ministers. Uh, that was not as challenging as the Moi cabinet ministers because Mo, Kenyatta loved. Uh, order, orderliness, and then also consistency, mm. and uh, and to respect people's space. Sure. Unless you annoy him, like I hear one one of his ministers, Doctor Doctor um, Gikonyo Kiano Julius, annoyed him one time because <laughs> of some issues that were related to integrity and the graph. Yes, it, we were told. I don't know how it is. Ali chukua kiboko and he killed the guy. Yeah, I anyway, so him he didn't have a high turnover of cabinet ministers like Moi. Mm. When we were now doing the cabinet, no Moi cabinet ministers, mm. uh, and like uh, we had over at least of over hundred uh, former cabinet ministers to wow. write and, about. And you know, like, they, they, apart Moe, from the Tana, Moe, Tana, the, 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 he had he had huge cabinets. Who, who President Moi? Moi, yes. Ministers. Yeah, President Moi had over 100 cabinet ministers during his 24-year uh, tenure as president of the Republic of Kenya. Mm. But his, his, his predecessor, Jomo Kenyatta, for 15 years, he had barely uh, 50 cabinet ministers because he maintained them. Yes. All one had to do, of course, to behave and then also to make sure you get the mandate of the public. Mm -hmm. Meaning you're elected as a member of parliament. Yes. You, know, you are to be elected as a member of parliament. Then, you... So that those were the two books I've done with the Kenya Yearbook Foundation. Mm -hmm. Since then, uh, they've done the Kibaki cabinet ministers. Mm -hmm. And right now here, they are working on the uh, Uru Kenyatta cabinet ministers. Oh, okay. Other than that, I've also been, had a good working relationship with the Kenya Correspondent Association, yes. which which is chaired by Olojanak, former nation Migori uh, correspondent, yes, who was sacked by one of our bosses, Mwangedi Mwangiwai, because he was trying to uh, he was agitating for correspondents to be treated properly and be paid well. <laughs> Was so that was a crime. He started this organization. That was a crime. And uh, twenty years later, he's still chairman and. Uh, the, Correspondents have got a lot of benefit a lot from it, which is another yeah. story yeah. for another day. So yeah, he approached right. me as, I, I well, think, as his former I think, boss. I think as, you will look for him for me so that we can also do something. We can also, he right. can no. come and tell us about his, uh, 
experience. Definitely, I'll do that. As correspondent. So uh, the, my partnership with the KCA uh, also bore fruit. Uh, we then approached me to help them uh, come up with a guidebook mm. on uh, how to write, how to cover the 47 counties that were created in the uh, 2010 constitution. Okay. So we went around, solicited views from the correspondents and other media stakeholders around the country. Then we published that booklet. So Mr. Olale, we've been uh, here talking for the last almost one hour and uh, it's time to wind up. And I would like us to briefly tell us about what, are you, what your plans are like, and also maybe give a, a word of advice to youngsters or people who may be having that challenge of being rich French and they may not know what to do or anybody else who may be, who may be listening to you. Thank you very much. A quick one, number one. Uh, what am I doing right now? Uh, I am. I've, I started a blog. Uh, I'm calling it Destination Safar Log. Mm. I added it to be unique. Say it's not Safari. It's Safar Log, Safari. where I've, I've managed to do, I've managed to document fifth over fifty stories of the destinations I traveled to, or uh, when I was at the mainstream national media, and now under this NGO. Okay. Those fifty destinations are international covering the US presidential elections in 2009, mm. uh, German elections, among others. Mm. Locally, uh, in, then we have stories about Africa, uh, exp the experience in South Sudan, as I've said earlier on, family trips to, uh, to Cape Town, Johannesburg, Zanzibar, among others, and official trips to Khartoum, mm. uh, Rwanda, among other places. Okay. So uh, the 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 end uh, the end game for this project uh, I've been having the blog which I release stories every week. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, be able to just check on my website. It's called this destination safarlog dot com. Okay. Uh, the end game for this is to publish a memoir. One of my 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 uh, my mentors or oh, one of the people I admire most uh, out there in terms of uh, as leaders and also as a writer is. Barack Obama Jr. And I've, I read his promise land. I said, honestly, we are doing ourselves a disservice. We must be able to document our experiences. We have to. So by December, December 1st, 2022, and I'll turn 62, my prayer and effort is to publish that book. Wow. Wherefore, I advise to everybody, to people who are listening, life is a journey every step, every day, uh, but it is full of hills and valleys. And and all and and uh, high moments and low moments. Mm. What makes life interesting is by you having a, having something to look forward to. Mm. We'll wake up and do something. And meanwhile, and then also you must be good custodians of what I call God's time. Mm. Make use of that time. Yes. How are you going to use of that time in a total quality management? Where we were there with the Patrick, my the, the interview were. We are taught, you start your day after your prayer and all this, if you, you're prayerful. In the office, you start by writing three T's, things to do today. Mm. Then you, the ones you didn't complete today, to, there'll be things to do tomorrow. Yes. But don't write things to do tomorrow, just write T, T, T. Hey. And then on, in terms of what we can do and what we should do, let us make sure we continue having good networks, good PR, good communication skills, and most of all, respecting each other. Thank you very Thank much. You. We, we, have one, we have one minute to go. And there's a lot, there's a lot. Because you need also, we didn't talk about your community work, what you do at church and so on, but there's a lot and there's some more that's coming. Yes, we are going to talk about that later. <laughs> this is a book that I'm reading now called Son of the Nile by Teddy Warrior. I yeah. do a lot of reading. That's the other thing we must also do. Yes. There's the newspapers, there's the new novels, there's the Bible, there's all online. Please, the mind is like an umbrella. The more you use it, the better it is. If you close an umbrella, it is of no use to you. <laughs> That's my strongest advice, among others.